<laughs> All right. Welcome back to SOS. I'm Stas Arm Badass. Sippy Go. That was a cool song. I haven't heard that song on the radio in a while. I I always hate it when I play a song I haven't heard in a while. I'm like, eh, I want to play that song. But it's too late now. It's, it's over. It's gone. But we're here. We're, we're here, here with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> we're here to talk about antibiotics. <laughs> Yep, Let's and um, you know, this is only for SHDF purposes, so I'm just going to talk about, uh, for this one, penicillin, because there's different um, ranges and classes of antibiotics, and um, I'm going to give a little terminology background, too, because, you know, if you come across some um, instructions for antibiotics, it's not always black and white, sometimes they put in you know, medical terminology, and it's kind of good to know, or hopefully you'll remember, but anywho. So, intro to antibiotics, 101 with Sippy. Um, I said before, antibiotics are mostly found in soils and can be found in, like, ocean waters, and a lot of them are actually toxic, and I think out of over 400,000 species that they have screened, only three are useful. And within like the past 40 years of them screening just like probably millions of different uh, soil samples, only a handful of new ones have been discovered. So that kind of just kind of puts in perspective of, you know, how long this process takes. And it's, you know, not something that you can just be like, okay, Billy, let's grab some dirt and rub it in your wound. And let's pray you got the one that kills the streptococcus. And yeah. So anyways, that's just a little tidbit background. And um, a lot of the, uh, like, microbiologists and stuff, they uh, they have a classifications of your bacteria into like gram negatives or gram positives because a lot of the antibiotics when they're explaining it under like descriptions for what type of bacteria you need to kill they're going to follow uh, into one of those two classes and basically it's when they do their uh, staining steps to know what kind of bacteria it is gram positive is you know we think um, purple pea purple and it's got like a, um, it's more the the outer shells are more penetrable to get in. So usually um, gram positive microbes are easier to kill. And then the gram negatives, they stain red. So they know, okay, we're going to put that type of uh, bacteria into that class. So we know what kind of um, antibiotic that we're going to use. So... That's, that's what that means if you ever run into someone that's like, oh, is this gram positive or gram negative? It's just classifying that bacteria so you know what type of uh, antibiotic, antibiotic to use. And the, um, they also use a term, I'm pretty, I don't know how many people have heard, but it's either a narrow range or a broad range spectrum antibiotic. And you know, you break the words down broad range, it's, it can cover a whole plethora of stuff. And that's what the doctors, and I've seen it firsthand in the hospital, will order. If they don't know the type of infection, they will go ahead and just order a broad range spectrum antibiotic until they can determine what type of bacteria is causing this infection. So. You know, that's just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind if you can find an antibiotic and if you look up information from it from like your uh, whatever type of books you might have or I don't know if it would come in, I don't even know if it really, I don't think it'd really say it on the container itself, but broad range is the way to go because I mean, unless you really have a microbiologist or somebody who has a microscope and has all the stains and knows the specific steps to perform it, you're going to have a hard time diagnosing unless the signs are very distinct and unique because, like I said before, there's there's different types of infections that have similar signs and symptoms, so sometimes you can't always go by the signs of what you see. So, uh, but the bad thing with those is, um, like we've mentioned, 
is it also can kill your natural flora in your body because um, it's broad range is supposed to be stronger. So not only is it killing uh, whatever it is that's invading your body, it's also killing the good bacteria that's keeping that good balance from like the yeast overtaking, like especially in your mouth and whatnot. And that antibiotic that you're taking, it's not going to kill off that um, that yeast because it's that's that's a fungal, so an antibiotic is going to be useless. So when they see that um, you get thrush in your mouth, which I've seen from especially older people when their immune system's more suppressed, um, that they get that thick white tongue, and it's the yeast overtaking and. Yeah, that antibiotic isn't going to cut it. you got to get your antifungals on. So, I think that's pretty much it for intro. And we'll move on to penicillins. And I like doing a little history, so bear with me. I know you guys are like, get to the good stuff. Just tell us the names and move on. No, we're not doing that. <laughs> so, uh, it was 1928. Alexander Fleming accidentally discovered uh penicillin because he just had a little container of mold just sitting by its lonesome and he accidentally knocked it over into his little petri dish of um i can't remember what type of bacteria species it was but um he saw that the bacteria would not grow anywhere near the mold and that's how he discovered it was a type of uh, penicillin species and from there they started doing more research and trying to figure out, well, how can we make this um, more potent, more um, acclimated to the body so it can actually kill off the microorganisms without making it too potent where, you know, you're harming the host. So uh, it was interesting during World War II, it was in England where they really started to figure it out and they were trying to um, manufacture more samples, but we all know England was getting bombed pretty bad and they were afraid that uh, their labs were gonna get destroyed and then there went all their work. So they actually shipped it to the United States and we were able to manufacture more and it started off with a moldy piece of cantaloupe. So there you go. That's how we started our penicillin, moldy cantaloupe. And back then, penicillin was used mostly for uh, sepsis, which is blood poisoning, especially in like appendicitis. So that was that was the main thing. And then from from then on, it's it's been evolving and treating more things. And we have two types of penicillin. Of course, we have the natural penicillin, which is our molds, and there's penicillin G and penicillin V. And penicillin G is only used. Um, in an injection, but the problem with the natural penicillins is they don't last very long and it's a very narrow range of uh, bacteria for it to kill. So when you do the injection for penicillin G, it only has a peak, which means it's going to be at its strongest point, oh, probably within an hour or two, and then it's just going to drop down by that third hour and it's not going to really do too much and that's the problem is and you can't keep giving people injection after injection you're going to give them toxicity you're going to poise start poisoning uh, their body so one thing that they did try to do is they did try to combine it with procaine and benzathine but the problem that they came across with that is it would keep that concentration going but the potency was lost and unless that bacteria was very sensitive to penicillin, it wouldn't kill it off. So um, they moved uh, to penicillin V, which you can take by mouth and it can actually endure through your stomach acid. But again, it wasn't as potent. It wasn't as concentrated because by the time the penicillin uh, reached through your intestines to be absorbed, a lot of that potency was was lost along the way so that's when uh, scientists start to do synthetic penicillins so half of it is still containing that mold and the other half of course is just synthetic through however in the world they do it i have no idea it's i magic. mean it to me it is magic it's just <laughs> 
doing whole the little chains and I don't know it's just crazy what they can do um, so when since they can do synthetic now the narrow broad can be actually a broad spectrum so now we can use it for more types including the gram negatives because the, the natural penicillins focus kind of more on the gram positive type of bacteria and then you know the gram negative that's the one that's kind of a little bit more tougher to penetrate through and the first one that they came up was um, methicillin but unfortunately with methicillin and kind of like we were talking earlier in the podcast is you know the name of the game for that bacteria to do is to survive and it evolves so it started to evolve and basically fool the body and it um, I think it was like a penicillinase as they call it where it basically can't be destroyed by penicillin and that's how we got MRSA methicillin resistant um, streptococcus aureus and so basically now in the United States we don't use methicillin anymore it's basically useless I mean it happens so fast um, what's the point you're basically just wasting um, resources so that's been dis discontinued in the United States and now MRSA has been used as a broad spectrum for any any type of bacteria that's resistant to penicillin they just kind of label it MRSA and and then we've talked about you know how that led to CRE and VRE and now who in the world knows but um, so after that happened, then they got their ampicillin and amoxicillin. And, you know, that's, that's a, um, a good potent type of penicillin that they've made. And amoxicillin is used a lot with children um, because that does kill off your gram positives and your gram negative bacterias. And when someone is resistant to that, then they do their um, carboxypenicillins. And that is carbopenicillin and tericillin. And that focuses more on your um, gram-negative bacteria and your pseudomonas aeruginos. And that's just, you know, a fancy type of bacteria that causes mostly like um, conjunctivitis from your eyes and otis meatus, which is just a fancy word for your middle ear infection. So those are good to use for those things and a couple of others. And I'm going to, I'm going to do another video of, um, just kind of comparing, you know, this streptococcus infection causes this, 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 and this, and just kind of give you guys a list of, um, what it is and what's causing it. And, um, but from that, if you're getting resistant, um, the most recent ones I think they have thus far is a uh, mesocillin and azlocillin so anything basically ending in your um, i l l i n's is basically a type of uh, synthetic penicillin so um, i don't know if they've discovered any more um, thus far but like i said it takes it takes time and bacteria is always evolving and that's kind of like it that stinks when you make antibiotics. Your body's um, always gonna either have like an allergic reaction, like our little one did to amoxicillin, and then you gotta try and figure out, well, what would be best to use for this infection? And just the bacteria are always evolving, so you just gotta try and stay one step ahead. But, and for people who are allergic to penicillin, I will tell you what you can use for your alternative in another video. But on boom. Um, Whole nother video. Yep. Nice. Uh, Sippy's been asking for about that. Well, the videos do get long, so it's always good to do that and break stuff up. Mm -hmm. Was that all you had? That's all I have for penicillin today. All right. Well, you're uh, you're watching us, Wes. I'm Sasha from Bettis. Sippy Cup. Have a beautiful, fabulous, fantastic day. You need to be stretch on strong. I know, right? And take it easy. It's the only way I can turn the camera off. I have to walk way over here.